All right, guys, welcome to the Realignment YouTube channel. This is a new era for the Realignment. As you guys know, Breaking Points with Crystal and Sagar just launched. We are officially 100% independent of the Hill. Sorry about these headphones, by the way. I look like Zed Jelani because both my pairs of AirPod Pros died. So thank you, Zed, for the inspiration um, with these colorful headphones. These are literally my girlfriends. Listen, welcome to this YouTube channel. I know many of you didn't even know it existed. There are a lot of reasons behind that. And if you want to find out why, you can listen to the crossover episode that we did previously. This episode is awesome. It's with Frank Stefano, one of the best realignment guests ever. Marshall, you're the uh, previous person who interviewed him. So tell him a little bit about it. Yeah, this was pretty random. I had Frank on when Sagar was out of town because he had a book called The Next Realignment, Why America's Parties Are Crumbling yep. and What Happens Next. Thought it'd be a throwaway episode turned out to be not only one of our highest performing episodes, but during the conversation, Frank gave a better articulation of what the realignment is, what the space is, what we should be doing as a show than Sagar and I have ever done. So when we're thinking, what is the episode we wanted to bring in for all the new folks and those who've been returning to the show after the Breaking Points launched, we knew we had to bring Frank back. Yeah, it's look, I love Frank. I I listened to Marshall's episode with him. I listened to all of his YouTube videos. You guys need to go and subscribe to his YouTube channel. I really mean it. I binged it. This episode is all about what the show is about. History buff, what's next, what third parties, everything you guys love. So enjoy the episode. Um, you can see I was still in some of my breaking points clothes. We'll see you guys soon. Stefano, welcome back to The Realignment. Thanks a lot for uh, for having me back. Yeah, it's good. To see. You know, I'm so bummed that I missed our episode, Frank. I listened to it with Marshall. I was blown away. And I literally listened to, to like 10 of your YouTube videos um, after that happened. And just so, you know, exclusive behind the scenes look here, uh, I actually bought a poster of William Jennings Bryan, which is on my new set for breaking point. So that'll be behind me along with a bull moose party mug. So thank you seriously for all the YouTube That's videos that you've done. And I recommend highly to everybody out there, please go and check out, subscribe to Frank's re, uh, YouTube channel. It's really important. Uh, for a lot of people are coming into this. They probably have never even heard of the realignment podcast before. You're the perfect guest to start us off with. So people ask us all the time, what is realignment? I hear it all the time. Now it's, you know, basically in fashion, you literally wrote the book. So tell us, like, what is a realignment? Define it for us. All right. A realignment is a fundamental remaking of the, the basic framework of politics. It's a change of party systems, is what scholars call party systems. And mm -hmm. a, a party system is a system of two parties that are unique in time and place, that uh, they have a unique coalition of people, a unique coalition of ideas, and they will exist for decades and decades in a pretty stable uh, format because we, we create these parties in a moment of crisis. Usually there's a, there's a big crisis that happens in America and there's a big issue that has to be solved and there's a collapse of the old system. So we create these two new parties and sometimes they have new names, sometimes they don't, but they're new parties in the sense of in what they represent and, and, and who they represent. And then what happens is they, you know, they exist for decades and over time, they start to uh, decline because the issues that we created these parties to deal with, you know, the, the parties either solve them or new issues come up, uh, the issues decline, and the parties start to get weaker. And then eventually, you know, corruption starts coming into the system, nothing is getting done, politics starts breaking down, and then there's another great crisis, and it knocks those parties down. And there's a shattering of the framework of the two parties, and, uh, and and then there's a period of chaos, and then we recreate two new parties, two new institutions, whether they're, they're new names or, or not, doesn't really matter, but they're new in the sense of they represent something new and a new coalition of people, a new coalitions of ideas. And those transformations, that's what a realignment is. And so, you know, a lot of people use it wrong because people talk about realignments and uh, they talk about the sort of normal uh, push and pull of politics where like a demographic group will move from one party to another, yes. you know, like soccer moms have moved, it's a realignment or even the shift of the solid South, which is something people talk about a lot um, as a realignment, because you could look at a, an election map and you see a whole section of the country 
start voting for a different party. And that's a demographic realignment, but it's not a real realignment because it's not an ideological realignment if the ideas don't change. If the people in a certain area of the country change which party they support, they start supporting a different set of ideas. That's not a realignment of the parties because the parties stand for the same thing. The, the population has changed. So what, you know, a, an actual realignment is a fundamental remaking of the, uh, the, the, the framework. And I always, I talk in terms of, of essentially great debates that a party system at its heart is, is a debate. It is, like I said, we create these in a moment of crisis. There's some huge issue in America that has to get solved. And so we have a two-party system that has to get channeled through that system. So we basically split into two coalitions of people to fight about this set of problems. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so whatever these two coalitions, they each have an ideology and they're fighting about that big issue to try to get it resolved. And it's essentially a great debate over an issue. And so in these realignments, it's essentially the change of the issue, that, that the old great debate has fallen apart and a new one has begun, and we have to create a new framework to deal with the, the new set of problems. Yeah, so let's contextualize all of that, especially within the idea of great debate. So the current party system that we're going around is really centered around the New Deal, the Great Society. It's a big debate slash fight over small government, big government, limited government, not limited government. So even when you see new movements like Democratic Socialists, Bernie Sanders, AOC, they are new voting groups. They're new actors. But to your point, they are still operating within the same framework, which is even highlighted by AOC having Green New Deal posters that are modeled right. after. And by the way, they're sick posters. I love them. Seriously, yeah, they're, they're really great really cool. posters. Yeah. But they're modeled after 1936 WPA posters. So they even have the iconography of the old era. So let's get to what now. Like, What is, if, if the last party system that we're seeing come to a close here was focused on small government, big government, whether or not the New Deal was going to be sustained or not, what is the current debate that we're having right now? Right. So, all right. So the debate that's fading out, as you said, is, is this New Deal debate. It, it's a debate about how to reform America in an industrial mid-20th century world, right? So we had the, the, we had the, the New Deal happened, the Depression happened, and the old system collapsed because America looked discredited. You know, the, the Republic was really under threat because the, the depression happened, the country couldn't solve it. Industrialization had happened, modernity, the complexity of it. And so we had this big crisis in America about what to do about that, how to reform our institutions and, and make them work for the new modern world, by modern meaning the, you know, the mid 20th century world. So we created the Republicans and the Democrats you know, the FDR came up and he created the New Deal and he created a, a solution to that. And his solution was New Deal liberalism, which had, had merged essentially what had been separate ideas that had been split across the parties, populism and progressivism. You know, the progressives had mostly been Republicans, populists had been Democrats, right. and they merged it into this New Deal liberal ideology. And then everyone who opposed it got pushed into the Republicans and they became this new ideology of conservatism. A, a new version of conservatism that came up under under uh, uh, Buckley and the National Review Group, and um, that had become that became an ideology that was pushing back against New Deal liberalism, where they thought it uh, stepped on other values, you know, particularly things like liberty and and, and natural uh, national virtue. All right, so that's the old system. So all of politics that we've known in our lives has been that fight over essentially over FDR's New Deal translated into social issues, the Great Society, which is the New Deal using progressivism, the idea of expertise and planning to plan society for the benefit of working people and the marginalized and the least well off. That was this new ideology of New Deal liberalism. And then the conservatives pushing back on, okay, some of this, these reforms are good, but we need to make sure that we limit it. We, we need to make sure it doesn't trans, uh, transverse on other values. All right, so that's what we've been fighting about through the you know, taxes and, and the size of government and then through social big government. And that's what's breaking down, right? And it's breaking down because that fight is a fight over essentially an industrialized you know, mid 20th century economy. So now we have this new problem. Well, a whole set of problems that all come from a new big issue. And, 
and the start of the new great debate, and that is the transformation to, to the post-industrial uh, information age global economy. And it's more than just an, an economic problem because every time you change the economic basis of the country, you, it has a huge number of, of, of fall-ons all over the, the, the rest of the, of the world and culturally and socially. You know, you think of something like industrialization and what that did, you know, all the problems that it created, you know, it killed off the small town family farms because those would haul, you know, had been built around the agricultural economy. And so it killed all yep. the towns that had supported them, but also immigration and uh, child labor and a new religious revival and, and all of this. So now we're having the same problem again. And we have to find, we have a whole new set of problems about how to reorder society again, because the fundamental structure of it has changed. So Frank, I think it would help Let's put this in the context of this is actually a pretty like average American phenomenon. It's just that it hasn't happened in a really long time. And one of the things I really liked about your videos is explaining kind of the first four uh -huh. realignments in American history. So, you know, long time listeners know I'm a big history buff. Let's start with the original. What was the first realignment in America? All right. So. You know, the first party system, which was the accidental party system, that's Federalists yep. and Democratic Republicans that, that blew up, right? Because we had this debate about, we'd written the Constitution, we'd written these documents, we came up with a republic that nobody had ever tried before, and nobody knew if it would work, much less how it was going to work. And then we had this big national debate with the founding generation about how to actually implement this thing that they had created. And then that thing started to fall apart. In the War of 1812, the Federalist Party blew up. And, uh, and, and we tried to go without parties again because the original founders uh, didn't like parties. They thought they were corruption, right? They had this idea of, of a, a country that was supposed to be built around you know, rational enlightenment ideas, the idea that you would get groups of people working together to get around all the protect protections that they had created. I mean, basically a political party, people have sometimes call it a conspiracy to get around the constitution, which is kind of true, right? You know, get all the mm -hmm. Madisonian, protections that we had in, our, in, in the country. All right, so now we have, but we have a whole new set of problems and that's the frontier. And, yep. and, and we had now Slavery. become, yeah, yeah, well, well, that's, that, that's, 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 that was the third. Yeah, not yet. It's coming. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah, we're getting there. What yeah. we're dealing with is Andrew Jackson, right? So why, yeah. you know, why does Andrew Jackson happen? So that's the first realignment. So the first party system is Federalists and Democratic Republicans. The first realignment when that falls apart is under Andrew Jackson, because uh, you know, we created this country as a bunch of cities dotting a coastline, and uh, now it is, you know, spanned the Mississippi River, and that raised a lot of questions, particularly about democratization and, and democracy, because, mm -hmm. you know, we have all these now people have spread out over the plains, and they've carved out their little farms in the wilderness, and they're not all living in Boston anymore, and people want to be represented, and they want all these ideas of democracy to come up. So that was what Andrew Jackson was about. Andrew Jackson comes in, there's a lot of discontent, and um, those who liked Andrew Jackson uh, ended up you know, becoming the Democrats, and the people who didn't like him got pushed into an opposition that got you know, John Quincy Adams and, and Henry Clay got together and tried to take all of this disparate uh, opposition and turn it into a party an ideology which became the Whigs. And they had to channel this fight about how to now adapt this elite little republic that we created into a, a continent spanning republic and to bring democracy uh, and development to everybody. And that was so that was the first party system. And that, I that was the first get, realignment. Yeah. And I, and I want to get to the timeline here because you have this really fascinating dichotomy of a bad realignment, which is what you see during a, a, a bad realignment process, yep. which is the Civil War. That's literally the two parties are murder, killing each other. And then you have a good one, which is what you really see during the Progressive Era, culminating with Theodore Roosevelt and the references to William Jennings Bryan. But before we get there, let's just talk a little medley about yep. parties, because something that is true with our audience and is definitely true with your audience is a lot of people who are attracted to realignment thought, quote unquote are people who hate the party system. They're uh -huh. people who say, I'm a politically homeless person. Like this is their identifier. And coming from DC, and I'm sure this is true for you, this is a weird, yeah. I didn't know that these people existed, but it's very much the type of outside of the politics business, that's a normal thing to think. So 
why is it that this system inevitably results in two sides? And then to follow up on that, because I know what your answer to this is going to be. Yeah. What do you think of efforts to reform the system so you wouldn't just have two parties? So yeah. multi-party democracy, changing, let's say even going up to changing the constitution, first past right. the post. So it's just sort of the, why the, do we have Lee parties and what do you think? Yeah. Yes. We've had Lee on the pod. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I saw. Yeah. And, yeah. And he, you know, he's been really pushing really hard on these ideas that, all right. Okay. Well, why do we have two parties? All right. So we have two parties. A lot of people blame it just on first past the post voting, right? So that, that because you have majority rule, right? Um, the incentive is to band together until somebody can win a majority, right? Because you can't, if you, if you need a majority to actually win an election and you need majorities across the system to actually exercise power. You can't just you know, win one election, you gotta win elections in every congressional district and governors and senators and, and all this. So anytime you have majority rule, um, you're going to end up sort of getting into two big coalitions. And if you have elections the way that we do them, that happens, this faction building happens before the election and you end up with two parties. And then the part of it that I always like to emphasize that people don't often think about is you also end up with two parties that are each about 50% because um, if you're getting too many votes, you're also, the incentive is if there were three parties, two of them would get together and they would make compromises because they could win all the time. And then the third would be left out. But then the, if they did that and they had more than they needed, which is a little over 50%, well, now they'll start shedding people because every person you add to the coalition is more people you have to satisfy, more issues, People have vetoes against other factions. So if you get over 50% too much, you start shedding people. And that eventually the structure of the Republic leads back to two and only two parties in each of them at about 50% and struggling for a majority. And, uh, and then because it's a federal system the way we have it, it ends up being national because you can't just rule in one area. You got to rule across the country. All right. So those who like multi-party democracy, what they'll tell you is, well, if you got rid of, you, you, you did some kind of voting reform, um, uh, sort of ranked choice voting or something like this, uh, you could have multiple parties. And there's obviously plenty of democracies that do something like this and they have parliaments and they have multiple parties in them. And then everybody gets a party that they like. And, uh, and the idea is maybe you'd be able to stop, I, I disagree with this, but some people think that you would be able to limit extreme parties, though I think actually it empowers extreme, extreme parties. The thing about doing that, though, is you still have a majority requirement. You've just moved where the majority has to be, right? Now, we do it, the majority has to be formed before the election. If you do a multi-party democracy, the majority has to be formed after the election. So once you get to par parliament, all those little parties have to come together and pick a prime minister, and they have to have a new majority coalition. And they end up being exactly the same in most ways because what we call a party faction, they call a party. But you can't get around the core problem of two and only two coalitions if you need a majority to rule because the majority is 50% and you're always going to get back to a little bit over 50% and struggling for a majority. So the problem with these, I, I find some of these ideas a little utopian, this idea that we can fix it with multi-party democracy because most multi-party democracies, I mean, the, the coalitions can be a little bit more flexible, but at the end of the day, you still need two coalitions to exercise a majority, and yes. you haven't really fixed the problem. So the problem is not that our democracy is not designed right. Like, the problem is not about ranked choice voting. Like, sure, it could help. It could help a lot. But the problem is we're not asking the right questions. Like, yeah. and Marshall recently found this tweet of yours, which I love. Quote, our entire society, all of our institutions, all of our politics are built around the assumptions of a 20th century industrial era world that no longer exists. We have to reinvent everything. This mm -hmm. is something where I have a lot of debates with people. Uh, politics is downstream from culture or culture is mm -hmm. downstream from politics. I think it's a two-way street. But whenever it comes to this, I would say society is downstream from our economic and social conditions. So mm -hmm. from that perspective, lay out why we are asking the wrong questions in our politics and in general. Yeah. Well, and this just gets back to, again, this idea of having to reform everything around a new set of rules, 
right? So it's not just our, our, our politics, everything that we have, you know, even if you think of something like the assumptions behind the social security system or tax system, everything is built around a group of assumptions that life in America looks like mid 20th century. Yep. People work in industrial job. Um, we have mostly national markets with a little bit of international trade. Uh, there's a cold war world going on. These assumptions are baked into everything and the social and cultural ways that we used to live. And that's no longer true. So that, and that to me is that's why the new party system, I think this is why the old one's falling apart because it creates all these new problems where, you know, as I like to say, like if you look at a problem like China or, or AI or automation, okay. And if you try to plug it into the new deal debate, the answer is neither fight big government or more new deal programs. Yes. Right. So, so, and, and that, but that's all our parties know how to do. That's the only tools they have. So, and, and our whole political debate is it's not even just even within politics, the way we debated on Twitter, it, our whole debate is built around the two tools we have are more new deal programs, more, you know, sort of uh, new agencies and new programs or fight big government. And it's a non sequitur to this whole new set of problems. And, and that is, and, and, and so, the real problem that what we have to do as a country, if we're going to compete and, and not go into a national decline, is we have to start taking all these institutions, the way we work, you know, the way we, we regulate everything, our tax system, our social security system, um, we have to take all of it and rebuild in these new assumptions that, okay, how do we live and work and what do we believe now in this in information age economy? And let's make those the assumptions of everything. And that means, you know, reforming everything. And that's the debate the country needs to have and, and that we're not having because we're too busy fighting about, you know, FDR. Here's what I wonder, though. Is it possible that, because once again, you created a historical model and models aren't always perfect. So let's mm -hmm. not keep you too close to the barrel on that one. But I think what's interesting is, especially with the earlier realignments, mm -hmm. I feel as if the debates were more clear cut in the sense that the questions themselves were, for example, are we a country of agrarian farmers or is there an, or is there an industrial yeah. Yeah. commercialized urbanized country? I, that, I had, guess that, that had a very, that debate had a clear answer in a way that the debate over so for example, someone who, I, I don't agree with this position, but if I'm a progressive listener, I think, um, Frank, we've been debating universal healthcare for a long time and mm -hmm. that debate is not finished. We're not going to move on yet. So how do you just think about that point? All right. Well, and, and in my answer to that, somebody who would say that would be, well, you know, we're always going to be debating healthcare in any system because healthcare <laughs> is a fundamental human thing, the same way we're going to be debating taxes. The question isn't whether we're going to be debating healthcare, it's how are we going to be debating healthcare? What are the systems that we're going to be talking about? Uh, you know, what are the assumptions about how we're going to be doing it? You know, debating, there's not only one way to debate about healthcare, and it's not just about, um, you know, the way that we've debated it in the 20th century. But I guess the other part of it about the, the parallels, see the one that I always gravitate to, because I do think it's very similar, is, is this progressive realignment because um, in the populist and progressive movement, because it had a very similar cause, I think, which was this industrialization problem, right? Well, you know, what had happened, right? America is, in for, is a country of small towns and family farms, and that's the middle class. Middle class American in the 1890s was, was the descendant of somebody who'd carved out this farm and, and it, it was a farmer on a family farm. And now we have, factories in cities. We have railroads now taking a cut of the markets. We have uh, uh, deflation, the farmers are going bankrupt. All right, so what did you have? You had a whole middle class of America that had worked hard and played by the old rules. And then the rules changed and they didn't know what was going on and they were left behind because they thought, hey, I did everything right. I did the same thing my, my, my dad did and my, my grandpa did and I ran the farm and I'm going bankrupt. All the while, because the people who jumped ahead to the new world, Rockefellers, Carnegie's, you know, who people who had started out as, as you know, Rockefeller was a clerk, he was a poor clerk, Carnegie was a, as an, an immigrant. And 
I see a lot of parallels. Okay. And then and you say it's simple what to do about that. But, you know, there was a lot of downstream problems. You know, the, you know we had these factories. Well, it created a, a huge, you know, burst of migration because there's all these jobs in the cities. You had all the, the small towns emptying out and the social upheaval that had caused. Uh, you had antitrust. Now you have these big national businesses. That was a new problem we'd never had before. You know, all businesses have been local. We had problems like child labor because now we have these factories. And, 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 and then that caused also a lot of other issues like temperance and women's suffrage. There was a huge religious revival that, that had happened in a social and moral reform movement uh, with the social gospel and the progressive movement. So I look at all that and, and I think it's actually very parallel to where we are now. And the answer to it was throwing out the, all the orthodoxy of the Gilded Age parties and like coming what? up with- Like what, what, what were their orthodoxies? Because yeah. this is a period of history that I find people really yeah. don't Nobody have knows that much of yeah. a background yeah. in. Yeah. All right, all right. Let, let me get, so the Gilded Age, it, it is actually, it, it, it's not talked about because it's so stagnant and corrupt that <laughs> nothing happened. There's a great <laughs> quote by, uh, I think, Henry Adams about like the, from the entire period of, you know, 1870 to 1890, you know, there was nothing happened, but like to, to corruption and decay. And, uh, anyway, it, it was a terrible, terrible period because, okay, what had happened? The parties were built on the Civil War. We had a Civil War, and then we had two parties built to fight that war and then the aftermath of the war, which was mostly reconstruction and, and rebuilding. And that ends in the 1870s because um, America is exhausted and we reach the end of reconstruction and nobody wants to push it any further. And we have two parties that are structured around fighting about the Civil War. So every election, this is rum, Romanism and rebellion. So there's nothing happening. And yet every election, people come out and wave the bloody shirt of the war dead and, and start talking about you know, rebellion, and we relitigate the Civil War. And the reality of politics is nothing is happening at all. It is utterly the most corrupt period in American history because it's all just careerism. It's about siphoning money from the government. Yeah. Uh, people, it, it, the only reason, there's nothing happening in politics, so it, just, it makes it just about spoils. All the politicians are in the pockets of the railroad companies, right? The railroad companies are giving out free railroad passes to the politicians. Politicians are looking for jobs on corporate boards of all the big companies. And so it is a period of, there's like a 20 year period where nothing happens in American politics is utterly just in decay. And, and while this is happening, we have this industrialization problem. So there's big problems that people need to solve, which is my family farm is going bankrupt and all the parties could talk about is fighting the civil war. But what am I going to do about the railroad companies that are now taking a cut of my profits and I'm losing the farm? And that's why there was a populist revolt. There was, that was what caused William Jennings Bryan. There was a huge populist revolt that happened um, yep. that created a third party, the People's Party, of all of these Americans who thought that politics couldn't deal with their problems and they were gonna do it from outside the system, which then caused William Jennings Bryan to win the Democratic nomination. He's a 36 year old kid, really kind of an outsider in a lot of ways. And, um, and, and comes in and taps into this new populist party and this new populist spirit, wins the Democratic nomination and throws the entire guts of their party out, throws the leaders out. The leaders try to create their own little splinter party to stop him. And, and triggers this realignment where then the Republicans have to respond and that leads to Teddy Roosevelt and they become the progressive movement, uh, the, the, the prog uh, progressive Republican party. And, and it leads to actually dealing with the problems. So you had two parties that were corrupt, nothing's happening. And now all of a sudden we're doing all kinds of innovations and reforms and trying to solve problems and, and dealing with all the problems that had been neglected. So, so here's, here's the thing then. Let's go over, I, I want to take it back to something you said. Good realignments and bad. Let's, so I think you just laid out a good one. Yeah. Give the bad realignment parallel, and then let's go through how you see the future playing out, given Trump, what yep. a good Trump realignment looked like or could look like, and what a bad one will look like. All right. So the big difference between uh, the good and the bad realignments that we've had in history is about whether we, whether somebody comes out and emerges and jumps into the change before it collapses, yes. or we let it collapse and 
Uh, we, we, we create a vacuum and all the worst people and the worst ideas start pushing and pulling to get into the center of power and the whole system falls apart. And then we have to do that work from the chaos and the rubble of the collapse. And so we were talking to so the Brian realignment and, and, and I think a lot of the FDR realignment, similar to that. These Great are good ones. Right. <laughs> yeah, because because somebody came up, Brian in, in 1896, FDR in 1932, who they took charge of their party. They threw out the guts that were outdated and they radically innovated, not just innovated in a couple of policy ideas. They built brand new ideologies that drew on completely different coalitions, you know, that, that cut across the parties and just rethought everything from scratch. All right. So what happens if that doesn't happen? And that's a civil war. All right. Well, why did the civil war happen the way it did? And, you know, the big thing that always comes out is that, you know, failed leadership across the board. All right. Slavery had become an untenable issue that had to get resolved. And, you know, the, the early, and it was a bunch of reasons for it. One of it had to do with, there was a religious revival that was the second great awakening that was this most powerful religious revival in American history, which created the abolition and movement that had transformed the way Americans looked at the problem from something that could be compromised around to a moral evil that could not be delayed. And that changed the entire tenor of the issue. But then also the Mexican-American War, where all of a sudden the United States took, you know, I think I forget how many states worth of territory, 10, 11, something like that. And we have to admit 10 states in a row. And each one has to decide, is it going to be slave? Is it going to be free? Yep. And, and that's two senators. So now this is a urgent issue that has to be dealt with and it can't be put off anymore. And America's political class, seeing this new reality, and, and, and mind you also, the Jacksonian issues are also dead and resolved. So these, we have two parties that are fighting about there's Andrew no more, Jackson. There's no more bank. The country's expanded. It's, it's done. Right. Yeah. We've got, you know, we've built, we've, we've built all the infrastructure that a lot of that fights were about infrastructure. We built the infrastructure. We've reached the other coast manifest destiny. There's nothing. It's all just rhetoric now, right? It's all just parades and hoopla and, uh, and, uh, uh, and politics for the sake of politics and careerism. And now there's a huge issue that we have to deal with and the parties don't know how to deal with it because it cuts across their parties and they think it's a distraction. They think politics means the Jackson issues when politics now means something different in reality. And they try to compromise. They try to start doing all these stupid compromises to try to kick the can down the road, to avoid it as it keeps getting more and more radical. And so they do the compromise. So after the Mexican American war, they do the compromise of 1850 where they, the, the, you know, all the giants in the Senate get together and they try to do this deal to take slavery off the table and make it go away to go back to normal, which is yep. the dead issues no one cares about. <laughs> and the result is it blew up in everybody's face. And in 1852, the Whig party, the, the, the compromise had so alienated the Whigs that each faction hated each other. They couldn't work together anymore. The party got completely blown out in the, in the 1852 election. And so what happened next? And this is what makes it so kind of haunting. So what the Democrats thought in 1852 is now they're the majority party and they can do anything they want, yep. right? So they look at it and say, well, now the Whigs just blew up. They're going to be a mess for at least a decade. Now we have free reign to just do what we want. And, and they stumble into more stupid things like the, the, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. They reopen the Missouri Compromise. So because Stephen Douglas wants a railroad running through Chicago, and so they need to make Kansas a state. And so they decide to reopen the, the Missouri Compromise over slavery and then radicalizes it. Political activists start rushing in. They, what they decide is that Kansas, instead of being a free state, is going to get to vote. So the natural response is all the activists start rushing to Kansas to take over the state. And then they start fighting and killing each other. It's, it's awful. And so then the next midterm election, America throws the Democrats out of office too and elects the know-nothings. So the know-nothings, it was the American party, they called themselves, was this anti-immigration, um, anti-Catholic, very conspiratorial group that had grown out of these secret societies. But they're the last guy standing now. And so they're able to stand up and say, hey, you know, what about us? And Americans are so disgusted with both of the parties that are now crumbling they put the know-nothings in charge of Congress. 
And in, 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 there's a new Congress where it's a, it's a coalition, but a know nothing becomes Speaker of the House. There's political violence all over the country and the whole system starts spiraling into collapse. And, and it took that spiral and hit and rock bottom to get the Republicans and Lincoln to show up and to create the Republicans and to start restabilizing the system, which of course led to a civil war. And so the, 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 the moral of that story is, if you don't do it yourself, it will happen anyway. It'll happen the hard way. And once you lose control of the process, it's gonna, you know, you, you get violence, you get sort of potential, you know, horrible people, get an opportunity to take advantage of the vacuum that you created. And that's, so that's the worst realignment in American history. And it happened because our leaders facing a new set of issues tried to avoid them instead of to rushing into, to, into the change. Right. You're, you're listing so many fascinating things. I don't want to pick up the wrong angle. So bracket right. this if we need to, but what is the difference between a dead issue and an unsettled issue? So to give an example, your point was everyone's talking about the Andrew Jackson area issues. The parties were comfortable there. The system right. was set up that way. To draw parallels to today, and once again, this is not me making a statement of what policy I believe yeah. in, but the ultimate quote unquote issue that I think falls into this category is something like post, you know, post 2010s gun control issues yeah. mm -hmm. where you have a large amount of activists on on both sides um so let's focus on the democratic side though because that's where the change energy is coming from you have a lot of activists who you know post parkland want to change mm -hmm. the gun laws in the country and i think anyone who can look at this from a purely dead-eyed political perspective could say oh yeah that's just not happening just looking at the makeup of the country, looking at the coalitions, looking at the states, it's just not happening, especially in a state right. like Florida where Parkland yep. happens. So if I'm an activist listening to this episode, which I really hope there are some who are listening to this, uh -huh. how should they think about their issue? Because this is an issue where they could say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I think it's a travesty that America doesn't have gun control legislation that looks like Australia. Yeah. How can you I say, Marshall, that that's a dead issue? Okay. How should they think about this specific issue? All right. So I, I, it's not a, it is an unsettled issue. You're right. All right. So when I'm talking about dead issues, I'm talking about a dead great debate, really. The big issue in the framework that has enough power to unite half the country and to, to inform an approach to deal with the huge thing that's, that's happening. Okay. Now, when, I, when you were talking to me about gun control, what immediately popped in my mind was temperance, okay? Um, and women's suffrage, which is very much attached to temperance too. Mm -hmm. They crossed and lived through several party systems before they got sort of eventually dealt with, okay? But they were always sort of, they weren't directly, they, they were sort of side issues, okay? In that they weren't part of the big great debate. They, were, they had implications to it, but you know, there's always going to be stuff like that. Or you could even say, well, taxes isn't, I mean, will taxes ever be a settled issue? No. <laughs> I, I, I guarantee in every party system, we're going to be fighting about what the tax, I mean, we've always fought about what the tax rate should be and, and who should pay them and who shouldn't. Whiskey so, Rebellion, literally. Fighting. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and, or, or even, you know, banking regulation back to Andrew Jackson. Oh, we're still God, talking about yeah. banking regulation. Yep. So, so an issue is a discrete issue isn't what I'm j just talking about. It's more of the whole great debate, which is, all right, the dead issues of Andrew Jackson is, you know, how are we going to expand and democratize and, 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 and build infrastructure as the country expands across the frontier? Well, that's done, okay? That issue is gone. Or the Civil War, how, what are we going to do to reform the country in the wake of a Civil War? Well, that was done. That was resolved. Or the issues of populism and progressivism, which was a debate about how are we going to um, respond to the disruption of industrialization? Lots of issues with that between, you know, working hours and child labor and, and all the social issues. But that issue was dealt with. And so now we've got the New Deal, which is how do we 
uh, adapt the country to complexity of modernity. And the Democrats have their idea that we'll use expertise in policy and planning to benefit working people in the least well off. And the, the Republicans say, hey, there's other issues, you know, liberty and virtue. Okay, that debate, that is a debate that's grounded in the realities of post-depression, post-World War II America. And I think we've reached the end of that. And I think we reached the end of it probably by the end of the 90s, where you know, I think we all know there's not going to be another great society. And there's not going to be, we're not abolishing Social Security and Medicare. The institutions that we created in the New Deal that are still here are permanent for the most part, unless they get, you know, reformed in some other way, but we're not gonna, you know, the Republicans could campaign on social security privatization all they want, but it's not gonna happen. It and we all tried. know it. <laughs> yeah, and we all know They literally that. tried to do it. <laughs> like, But look at how that ended, right? And, and this yeah. is, I actually think it was the story of, of the Gingrich years. Um, the way I look at the Gingrich years in the 90s was both parties coming to the harsh realization of this because both of them at times tried to charge, you know, I. We'd reached through the whole party system and then through the Reagan, you know, we, the Democrats had put forth their ideas and then the Republicans in the 70s and 80s and early 90s kind of pushed back and put limits on those ideas. And America was basically happy with the consensus, which was both parties got some of what they wanted. Both parties had a point. And then you started seeing both parties trying, you know, between Clinton and Gingrich, they would try to push forward on the old debate again, and America would slap them down. And then they both learned, and now they talk about it in rhetoric, but nobody really seriously tries anymore. I don't think, you know, all the rhetoric we want in the world, we're not gonna do another great society. We may do some other uh, version of social justice, social reform, but we're not creating a whole new bunch of great society programs. But why not? I'll keep playing the Bernie socialist that I'm not. Sure. Look, <laughs> Frank, I totally buy your framework of we're focusing on 20th century problems and not answering 21st century questions. Actually, if we're looking at the 21st century, whether it's competing with China, whether it's climate mm -hmm. change, whether it's this, this, and that, actually a great society or e and a great society 2.0, not ruined by the Vietnam War, is actually the answer to this question. So why do you think that we should write off the Great Society? That's just an well, interesting point you made. Okay, well, what I mean by the Great Society is we're not gonna build a new centralized agency to solve each of these problems, right? And we're not gonna do something like, you know, one, one of the, the classics, right, of the Great Society was the housing projects. Classic Great Society effort. The idea that, um, okay, we have a problem, there's not enough affordable housing, people need places to live, so we will build big housing projects. And that, and it made sense. I mean, I, I'm sure if I was in the room in, you know, the 1960 and somebody had that idea to me, it would make a lot of sense. You'd be like, yeah, the government can more cheaply build the housing, um, the government could run it, it's all gonna be great. But then we learned a bunch of stuff about, well, it didn't really work the way that we intended. So even people on the left and the right, nobody wants to rebuild Cabrini Green or whatever, right? We're not gonna do that anymore. Now, housing can still be a problem. So we could solve that in a different way. And, and so it's not about whether we're gonna solve social problems. I, we're gonna continue to solve social problems for forever, but we're not gonna do it with the New Deal framework. Yes. And the New Deal framework is when you have a problem, you create a new program and an agency you give it to a bunch of experts and they will administer and plan progress. And, and, and originally in the New Deal to deal with economic problems. And then it, when we got into the social issues of the 60s and 70s, we start doing that for social problems. We're not doing that again anymore. We will solve those problems in a different way for a new era. That's kind right. of what I mean. Well, this is, it just reminds me. You know, if we think to the 1964, the LBJ, Great Society ambition, obviously that's what we learned. Then we have Nixonian backlash, you know, to that, not necessarily a realignment, but a relitigation again uh -huh. of exactly of what's happening there. I guess everything you're saying, though, I don't know what the fault lines of today are, as in I don't even know the question to ask. Slavery was just so clear cut. You're right. either slave or you're free. That was mm -hmm. it. 
And everybody tried to push it under the rug, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, all of that. And then the Democrats at the time overreach and Dred Scott and the, you know, Fugitive Slave Act and all of that. And it was all just, it. to me, the Civil War was unavoidable. Like when I read the history, I'm yeah. like, yeah, by 1850, I'm like, we got to fight it out, man. We're either going to have slaves or not. And th- today, I just don't know how that manifests itself. You, you know As what? in, go ahead. Yeah. I, I I fundamentally completely agree with you, and and that so this kind of gets into the the thing that we were going to talk about at the beginning, which is, yeah. all right. So what happens next? And and I think the point that you've identified, which I agree with, is mm-hmm. it is we are still in a point where it's up for grabs how we're going to divide into two factions and two ideologies to deal with these problems, right? Right. The problems are the, the big source of the problem is a complete social transformation that we haven't adapted to. And, and with global implications and, and we still haven't even started to stuff about, you know, with, whether it be climate change or AI and stuff coming down the road that we don't even know what, how it's going to play out. All right, so that's the problem. Well, there's not only one solution and there's not only one set of coalitions that could do it. And that's what's up for grabs right now. And that's what makes this era so interesting but dangerous because there are multiple ways to assemble a coalition to address those problems and there are better and worse ways to do it. And so if you look at where we're headed and this is the sort of the path of least resistance. Okay. So what, like, like when I look at what's going on in the last couple of years, all right, you look at this big problem of, of transformation. Okay. And then you look at, well, what's the easiest, most sort of low effort way to build two coalitions to deal with that? You know, if you just let things go, where would people naturally gravitate? And people gravitate between the people who like the change versus the people who don't, which is mostly a question of the people who benefit and the people who feel like they're getting left behind. Okay. And that's what I feel like the last couple of years. So we have two parties that are built in this New Deal framework. The realities and guts are getting pushed and pulled into two different groups, which is a coalition of all the people who look at all this post-industrial change and say, not for me, don't like it, I want it to stop, which is, of course, not really productive because you can't make it stop, right? It, it, any more than the French aristocrats could make f- feudalism come back. And you know, mm-hmm. when the French Revolution was happening, you, they wanted it to stop too. Yeah, but it, you're not gonna, you know, once you've taken that out of the box, once you've created the new technology, you can't make China go away. Like, you can't make it stop. But you get a co- coalition of the people who want it to stop. And then you have another coalition of all the people who say, no, this is great. A lot of them, people who have the tools and the abilities and the inclinations to take advantage of all the new opportunities it creates. And they say, this stuff is great. Now, the problem with that is they don't really have an incentive to cushion the blow of the people who don't like it or to take yep. them seriously or to worry about they could work for everybody versus just for them. And it's not because they're doing it even selfishly. A lot of times they don't even see it. They're like, hey, this is fantastic. What are you complaining about? Okay, that's what I feel like a lot of the last four years has been, those coalitions have been getting pushed together that way. And it's a terrible way to debate the problem because it's not gonna solve it. And I think it's a recipe for decline. That's what makes me so worried about it is that I look at this and say, um, it's just going to be angry. It's zero sum. It's not about reforming and rebuilding. It's just about recriminations and resentment. And that's where things have been headed. And, and that's why I look at Trump sometime. We were talking about Andrew Jackson. And I think there, mm-hmm. you know, people have made a lot of parallels. And the parallel that I see with that is I've always seen Trump as a, not a building figure, but he was a destructive figure. He was somebody who ripped the old system down and he didn't do it intentionally it was he was just operating by gut and helped start stripping the old safeguards and system away but without building a replacement and that's what andrew jackson did right i mean andrew jackson ultimately was a passionate guy operating by gut who was very polarizing and split the country in half between the people who liked jackson and the people who hated him so the interesting part came right after that which was henry clay and martin van buren who on each side once these coalitions had been kind of pushed together, then people came along and said, well, how do I turn that into a party? How do I turn that into an ideology? 
And Martin Van Buren was, was Jackson's sort of chief strategist and later his vice president. And he was the guy, the brains that said, how do I take this Jackson impetus and turn it into what became the Democratic Party? And Clay, you know, with Adams a little bit, but mostly Clay was the guy that says, how do I take all the people who hate Jackson and turn it into a positive ideology of what we're going to do? And that's what has been missing so far. But if you allow the sort of the low effort coalitions to keep going, somebody will do that and then it will solidify. So we, it hasn't solidified yet. It's still open that we could do something different, which I hope we will. And, I, and, and, and if we don't, then either somebody will come around and do it or we get the Whigs where, and that's the other war, warning scenario, which is, yeah. you know, there's a number of radical things that could happen in the next four years that we don't see coming um, that could rip one of these parties down. You know, it, right now, it's, it, there's nothing there you're, that you can put your finger on. But if it happens, it happens really fast. And that's why we talk about uh, party collapse as being like a bank run, because that's how they work, where, you know, they're super po as long as everybody believes in them and they have an incentive to keep them standing, they're unassailable. But as soon as people start running from the gates, um, you know, people, it just takes enough of a group to be unhappy to break the inertia. And then it, it very quickly all falls apart because politicians are you know, they're, they're ambitious. They want to save their careers. Once people start walking out, the whole thing collapses. And if you got the wrong candidate, um, some crisis like January 6th, there's a number of things that could happen that could still cause that to happen, which is why I would prefer an FDR, an FDR, William Jennings Bryan, a Teddy Roosevelt, or a new party that does this realignment, deals with these new issues in a way that's better for, that works for everybody, as opposed to you know, people who like it and don't fight and yes. over spoils. I would rather that we find a way and conservatism and liberalism for all the people, the dislike people have of them. The benefit of them was both of them saw their view as how to make America best for everybody. They had a huge disagreement, mm -hmm. but both the left and the right in the 20th century were fighting about how to reform America in the way they thought would benefit all Americans. And so I really don't want a realignment that's about, you know, looking out for me and sticking it to you. So this is where we get to the ultra pessimistic part where I hope you yeah. can give us a little bit of solace. And this is frankly what people always write in about, which is I hear everything you just said. And my conclusion is that we're in for a bad realignment Yeah. in the sense that, well, if you're looking at the polarization that we're going through right now, and obviously civil war is the ultimate form of polarization. Right. So this isn't trying to, this isn't me trying to be a historical and do the whole, oh, yeah. it's never been this. No, it's obviously been much worse. But my point is I hear about a third party replacing, I think I'll just say it. I think the Republican party, like at its core is just fundamentally broken as a governing institution, yeah. the whole yeah. unable to win the popular vote for seven out of eight elections. I think that's a key example of that fact. That isn't a dunk on conservatism or any of the actual belief, but I think that actual party um, has reached the ends of its actual usefulness. But that being said, the reason why that party doesn't collapse and the reason why you aren't going to see a third party is the polarized social issues. So as long as you have in our, and once again, these social issues aren't always going to manifest themselves the same way. So temperance and the debate over women's suffrage, that did not put a damper on the ability to reform the Democratic and Republican parties. But I think in our current iteration, so for example, the existence of people who, for example, are like, yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually not really interested in the conception of limited, limited government. Yeah. That's something that a new party could reapproach itself. And at its best, you saw, and this is mostly Steve Bannon writing fan fiction, but you saw Steve Bannon saying, hey, the Republican Party needs to move on. We need to not just, you know, have this 20th century model. Let's move on from Reaganism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when the voter who hypothetically could be attracted to that vision is more than fine with stalemates, especially at the state level around abortion, yeah. LGBTQ rights, even this is falling into like fights in the tech industry around content moderation. I don't see a way of being able to come in with a third party to address those issues in this current social polarization. All right. So I, I, please yeah, okay. give us something. I, I, I've given this a lot of thought too. And I was actually thinking about, I, I've, been, I've been meaning to try to write something about, write an article or something about 
how to make this third party because so all the things you said are absolutely true. And then the, 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 the biggest problem though, you know, you can look at the people who have been playing with doing this type of third party, you know, that whether the Evan Kamalin group and, and, and a little bit Bill Crystal and these guys that have been looking at this. The problem is everyone is doing it wrong. That I feel like if you gave me a couple of hundred million dollars and, and the right connections, I could get a new party going in two years. And, and this is why. <laughs> I, I really do. I think I feel you're like you're making I know a bold statement, yeah, Frank. You better be a this. big thing. Hey, maybe someone will Michael take Michael Bloomberg, me up on it. if you're listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, okay. So, how would you do it? All right. The, the first problem is you can't just create a new party that's a recreation of the 20th century GOP, which is the first big mistake everybody who's looking at this makes. We, and, and the reason they're doing this is now, if you listen to, to what their constituents are, you know, the, the, the types of politicians and the political activists who would be part of it, they all built their lives in the 20th century GOP. And so they don't like Trumpism. And what they want to do is go back to the system that's dying, which is a failure. Like if your goal of a third party is to recreate the 20th century political parties, you will fail, right? It just by naturally, there's not, you're not going to get 50% of the vote. There's enough people who've moved on already. How are you going to build a national majority by recreating a Reagan era political party? It's a, it's a fool's errand. Okay. So that's the first problem. And then you also need to build bottom up. And this is the, the Michael Bloomberg problem or the Ross Perot or whatever. Political parties are like, you can have a, a presidential campaign that, that captures a party and pulls a Brian. But if you're going to build an actual outsider party, you don't run one rich guy for president. You've got to build from, so you know, what I would do, and you need, the, you need the groundwork too. You need probably like a magazine, like a National Review or the, the New Republic, both of those. So the New Republic back when it was founded was the progressive movement's uh, uh, sort of ideological journal that did a lot of the work about turning an impulse into an ideology. And then in, in our party system, the National Review uh, played the similar role where they took everybody who hated FDR and they hated each other just as much. And they didn't know what they believed in. They just knew what they didn't like. Yep. And, you know, Frank Meyer and those guys turned it into an ideology. So you would need to do that. You'd have to you'd, you'd need a, a, a group of sort of writers and think tanks. Not you don't need media people. You don't need political strategists. You need writers and thinkers and policy people to build the guts. And then what you would do is then you would run in the midterms, you would try to win about 20 congressional seats, I would think, just mm -hmm. enough so you mattered, right? So you would come into the next Congress with 20, 25 new members of a block that was neither Republican and Democrat, and now you're real, maybe one or two senators. And, and if you did that, you're the People's Party, right? I mean, this is how, or, or, or the Free Soil Party. You yes. know, any of these successful third parties, that's how you have to do it. And everybody who's looking at it is trying to either go top down or they're trying to um, start at the presidency. It's just the wrong way to go about it. And that's what, so that's why if it doesn't happen, I feel like it's a failure of leadership, not potential. I think the potential so, to do it's there. What's the platform for that party today? If I gave you 300 million. All right. I, there's, so there's a couple of ways you could do it, but probably you would want to solidify the, um, the you'd want to find around li enlightenment liberalism, right? Mm -hmm. All the people who are fundamentally enlightenment liberals. So, you know, you're talking center right, center left, though not completely, because some of the AOC people, it, you know, when, when you move on the left, it gets complicated because the, the, the group people call woke is actually like eight different groups of people with different yes. ideologies. So, you know, you're not dealing with the same group of people. And then you've got a lot of the sort of Trumpy Republicans too are also just, you know, they're, they're like former Whigs who became know nothings because that's yep. where the energy exactly. is. So you would build around, and, and then you would build around, you know, my idea has always been the American dream. So my take has been if you listen to the right and the left and what they're unhappy about, they all have different complaints that are the same complaint just coming from different directions, which is the game is rigged. Ordinary people like me no longer have a chance. Um, the system no longer works for ordinary people. And I can work hard and play by the rules, but I'm not playing on a level playing field anymore. 
whether it be because of global competition, whether it be because of there are people in charge of the system who don't like me or people like me, and everyone has a different idea of who that is and who people like me are, but they all seem to agree the system doesn't work, that institutions don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't work the way that they work on paper, right? There's a, there's a set of rules that we publish and then the real set of world, rules of what's actually happening. So I would run around that. I would run around a message of restoring the American dream that, and the American dream of social equality. The American dream isn't the dream of a car in your garage. The American dream, if you get back to the fundamental philosophy of it when it was created as an idea, is as a democracy, we're all social equals. We're not economic equals. We not all have the abil same abilities, but we're all socially equal and uh, equal to the same dignity. And we all are entitled to a fair shot at our dreams. And if we work hard and get a little lucky, we have a fair, ch everybody should have an equal chance. Nobody should be cutting in line, all of that. Make the system work the way we say it works. Make institutions live up to what th th their value, their stated values are. Get rid of the corruption and restore the promise of the American dream. That's my party. So last question, why do you need a third party to do this? Because everything you just said is something that a Matthew McConaughey on the center left, a Andrew yeah. Yang on the center left, a yeah. more competent version of Trump on the yep. center right, because he's weirdly center right, if we define center as mainstream, not as the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. <laughs> so it seems to me the only thing I would add to your strategy is that what I would do is say, hey, run as Democrats or run as Republicans. So let's let people in the audience choose their own adventure. Let's just take over 20 Republican primaries. Yeah. Let's, you know, and you said, and, and the thing that makes this so fascinating, and Frank, we're going to have to have you on again for a third part or at some point because we just keep, Love there's you. too many things to unpack in this massive space. But the thing yeah. is, what makes everything we're describing doable is that the parties are just so institutionally weak that there's nothing they could basically do, especially at a small local congressional level to stop you, or at a state party level. Andrew Yang might not win in New York City, but the fact that he almost has a very, you know, very, very, very good chance of doing so over career New York politicians, that is a story in the 20th yeah. century in the night that could not have happened. And that is because the term Democrat is just like a, it's like a record label. It says, hey, I'm center left yeah. to progressive, and I'm not like, I'm, I'm not a scary Republican. You know, I like, you know, I'm pro-LGBTQ. Yeah. But that being said, that's all anyone actually cares about. No one cares that I, Andrew Yang, attended the precinct committee chairs meeting and I was president of the call. No one cares. So yeah. it seems to me that in a situation where the parties themselves have no actual power and in of themselves are so hated, you can just take them over. And this is what Trump did. And this is yeah. what I hope the lesson from Trump is, which is yes. forget the debates about populism, forget the specific policy debates. If he had run as a third party candidate, he would have failed. Instead, yep. he was like, look, most of my views align pretty close to the right, to, to the right. I'm just going to run under that thing and tell people what you just said, which is the people who are running against are corrupt. They're rigged. They're weirdly in a Trumpian way, the 20th century. And that's how I think you should do it. Yeah. I mean, basically what you're saying is do it the FDR way and the William Jennings Bryan way instead of the outsider way. Which yeah. I would agree. I mean, like if that was possible, it's the better way to do it. It's it's the, the the smoothest transition is something like that. And I agree with Yang too because I've been fascinated by him because he's the closest thing to what I've been saying. And he should have no shot in politics. And it's all message. It's not because he is some super charismatic guy. Yep. It, it, it's not that he had the right connections or the money. The only reason this guy nobody had heard of four years ago is all of a sudden a national political figure is because he had the right message and he got the opportunity to get on a national stage and say what he thought. And people were so motivated by the message that he became a national figure that quickly. I, I mean, I, I, the fact that more people aren't fixating on that, the, the opportunity in that, right? Uh, but but the, the, the problem to me, and, and so look, if somebody could do that, that would be fantastic. The, the only reason that I am unsure of trying to do it through the parties versus from the outside is because I, it just seems to me 
that the party activists and the party uh, bosses and the people who are, are the, the, the operatives would kill it. That if you try to, you know, that there's so much resistance from within the party machines today that are basically career machines that to take one over, I don't know that you wouldn't get co-opted or defeated, but if you could do it, it would be by far to do it. I would rather do it your way, right? Like, let, let's have somebody, let's have Andrew Yang come out and run for president or somebody like him with a fresh message, win a party primary, throw out all the, the, the old bosses of his party, throw out all, all of the old uh, ideologies, all the orthodoxy and start from scratch and deal with a new set of problems would be far would be better. The only reason I've been looking now at a third party is because I don't know that if somebody tried to do that, that they could get away with it and not and, and not get completely shredded by the system. But the people would want it. I think there's a demand for it. They'd have to get through a primary. And, and, and then once they got in there, they would have to find some way to rely on staff who aren't the traditional people who staff administrations. Because right. then your, your next problem you have is now you're president and you have this, uh, this agenda of what you want to do. But if you fill your administration with people whose entire life is defined by the old system, they're not exactly going to help you do that. And, you know, you can give out all the orders you want, but ultimately who you staff the administration with matters. But so, and, you know, in a third party, you solve that problem because you come in from the outside, but then you have a whole nother set of problem about building a new brand and getting people to, to believe in it. Uh, so Sagar has to go in a quick second. So I don't want to ruin this for him, but this is a really important point to make because it shows how this entire framework isn't going to lead people where they want it to. You know what mm -hmm. the obvious outsider group who has no investment in the 20th century, who's competent and could staff something? It's the tech industry. Yeah, no, and I agree. And that's who's backing Andrew Yang. Like, that's the yeah. point. Andrew yeah. Yang's UBI funded by tech people. The people who are staffing the campaign, Tusk Ventures, right? Who mm -hmm. went, repped Uber and worked in those places. So once again, if you're a progressive, and this is why we, we were very precise when you were talking about this is a center left to center right thing. Yeah. Right now, specifically, because realistically, it's it's really just it's just so fascinating because I don't think what I just said is what anyone what a lot. There are a lot of people who hear this conversation and they want us to say, hey, man, like it's this working class GOP. It's this progressive working class, like for the people, Democratic Party. And as I'm just hearing this and guys, please push back in the comments if, if you just disagree. I just see, man, it's it's this weird center left credentialed under the old system. So once again, Andrew Yang went to Brown. He went uh -huh. to Columbia Law School. I mean, once again, this is what FDR and Theodore Roosevelt are. They're traitors to their class. Like that's the weird uh -huh. part of this dynamic. And FDR, the, the interesting thing about FDR too that I always think about is that when he ran in the 30, in 1932, he did not tell everybody what he was planning to do. And I yes. don't even know right. that he knew yet. I, there, there's a whole fight about this, about... Some of his staff knew, and they put it in his speeches, but he didn't know. He he came in and he empowered a bunch of smart people. He was to, not to ideological at all. He was a purely no. unideological player, which is why he was so brilliant and yeah. actually able to accomplish the political revolution that he did. I think. Right, I agree. I, I because yeah. I think he looked at. He was like, I have to solve the problem. The, the depression is going to kill the. There was a famous quote. Um, from Adolf Burl, who was one of his advisors, that when he became president, that his presidency is going to end either uh, with uh, him solving the depression or the collapse of democracy or something yes. like that. And, and it was true. And he knew he had to solve the problem. And he knew he had to throw out everything. And he got the brain trust, a lot of Republicans, a lot of Democrats, you know, it was a mix to just sm the smartest people he could find to solve the problem. And, and it caused him to innovate in ways that I don't even think sometimes he appreciated what he was how radical some of the stuff he was doing was because he was just that was the beauty of FDR is he didn't yeah. know because he was unideological he just uh -huh. did it and people were like oh. and he did, it, it was like a total departure from the system and it shocked everybody so much that they all just had to go along and that's how you get the majesty of the first hundred days all right unfortunately yeah. I have to step away Frank but I, this okay. has been an incredible episode I do have one person you should keep your eye on his name is Dwayne the Rock Johnson and I oh, do yeah. think I I'm, I'm telling you.
I'm telling you, I've been pushing this for a long time. I think he's the one. But that's another episode. Really appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank, thanks oh, for wait, having me. Real quick, Frank, where can everyone find oh, yes. your book and your channel and everything like that? Yeah, all right. So the book is The Next Realignment. Uh, you can find it anywhere. Books are sold, Amazon, and uh, uh, the channel is YouTube. Uh, the name of the channel is my name, Frank DiStefano, uh, and you can find all of the videos. Sweet. We'll have uh, all of that in our show notes and in our bookshop as well. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Frank. Take care.